I'm Jeff Rich. This is the Burning Archive. Social conflict, there's a lot of it about social fragmentation. It means there's a lot of different identities, a lot of differences between different groups of people within our society. It's the idea of a single cohesive society, a utopian dream today. Or should we find a different way to live together with all our differences in a more civil way? Should we be an island society or a society of islands? That's what I'm talking about today on The Burning Archive. And welcome everyone to the Burning Archive to episode 112, goodness me. And uh, today, again, I'm giving you a remastered uh, section of an episode I produced in 2021, which discusses social fragmentation. And this episode focuses in particular on the idea of how often we might think of social conflict or social fragmentation as between the people and the elites or the working class versus the ruling class of the oppressor versus the oppressed. But often social fragmentation is a lot more complicated than that. It can also be one elite versus another and the consequences of unbounded conflict between uh, different groups in society can be disastrous. Sometimes the idea of revolution can be inspiring for people, but it has also got a pretty tragic history to it as well. And I discuss that in this podcast together with some interesting ideas from the historian Peter Turchin, who since this episode has only just this year published a book, End Times, about political disintegration against this whole theme of conflict between elites. And it's a fascinating episode. I think I'll cover, I cover the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution. People who are interested in the history of revolutions will be interested. And towards the end, I do propose perhaps my own way of, you know, looking for a way forward of how we can live together, if not harmoniously, at least civilly within a society of increasing and proliferating differences. I hope you enjoy the episode. Uh, I'll be back just at the end to give you a brief message at the end, but do enjoy this. And I really begin this episode, this this remastered episode, by talking about how increasing social fragmentation is not either a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, just a social fact. It's just an aspect of our changing social landscape and how we really need to adapt to that reality. Increasing social fragmentation is a bad thing. What it just does is change the topography or landscape of society and of history. The consequences, good or bad, depend a lot on how the culture responds, how institutions adapt and how the balance of conflict and cooperation play out. Social fragmentation can lead to conflict, clearly, you know, us versus them, but it can also lead to cooperation. If you like, there's two tribes, they can choose to trade or they can choose to fight. Now, fragmentation is worse in some places than others, or perhaps the negative consequences of social fragmentation are worse in some places than others. And let's just draw a comparison between the United States and Australia. Australia has many of these same fundamental trends, and there is certainly, I think, this broad trend uh, in fragmentation happening in Australia, but it simply doesn't appear to have as many negative consequences as 
are occurring in the United States with uh, its riots, its political polarisation, its it, its general sort of descent into fears of civil war, which is really quite remarkable. Conflicts, of course, are endemic in any society. It, conflict's not a bad thing, it just happens, but some conflicts are more toxic or destructive than others. And sometimes conflicts can become so intense, social fragmentation and conflict can become so intense and so intractable that they lead to social breakdown, riots or revolution. And sometimes they lead to wide-scale protests. The protests are perhaps among the things that Emmanuel Todd, the French demographer who we spoke about last week, uh, was thinking of when he described the conflict between ed- educated elites and the more primordial democratic uh, popular instinct for democracy. They are also perhaps an example of the kind of chaos and potential social breakdown that another historian, Peter Turchin, has predicted based on, of all things, statistical models, highly reliable source, of course, but uh, we'll leave that aside, and particularly thinking about America. These historians have predicted chaos emerging from these patterns of social or this trend of social fragmentation and other related trends and particularly in the great declining imperial state of America. Peter Turchin who is a former Russian entomologist as in a scientist of insects who turned his uh, his eye to the study of long-term statistics in society, has predicted that we, and I quote here, we are on the verge of state breakdown where the centre loses hold of society. Perhaps more compellingly, in 2010, he published an article in Nature that predicted that there would be widespread chaos and potential social breakdown in America in the year 2020. As a result, Peter Turchin became quite a figure, appeared in many uh, news stories, periodicals, etc. in the year 2020 because he turned out to be exactly right. If whether he was right for right reasons is another question, but we will come to that later on. Now, both Todd and Peter Turchin attribute a lot of this problem of chaos, interestingly, not so much to the people on the streets, the gilets jaunes, the people rioting, or the rest of it, as what is going on amongst the elites, of conflicts between the elites that then get played out among others, a breakdown of authority and things like that. Now, I don't really think we, at least certainly not in Australia, America might be in a more difficult situation, but I don't really think we're quite at the point of crisis that Turchin might have predicted, or even necessarily that things will go that way. After all, most historical experience seems to suggest that slow adaptation to trends tends to happen, for good or bad, rather than the extreme scenarios of you know social breakdown, revolution, that kind of thing. And I also don't necessarily see our social fragmentation purely in, I guess, terms of class or, you know, elite versus, you know, 1% versus 99%, ruling class versus the people, nor that social fragmentation is only about conflict. Uh, I'm more drawn to, you know, I guess, organic metaphors of decay and regeneration of cooperation and conflict. Revolutions, after all, are rare events and mostly end up uh, eating their own. As Georges Danton, the French revolutionary uh, leader who ended up at the guillotine, said that the revolution is like Saturn, the Roman or Greek god who ate his children. It eats its own children. But the 
historian Peter Turchin does forecast that America at least is heading to such a crisis and his reasoning is interesting. He sees a dark triad, I think he uses the term, of a bloated elite, declining living standards and a government debt finance trap. He espouses what he calls structural demographic theory that argues that labour oversupply, i.e. too many university educated baristas, leads to falling living standards and elite overproduction. And these in turn cause a wave of prolonged and intense socio-political instability. He describes it as a structural trend that may or may not be realised depending on whether there are also trigger events. Interesting theory. He may well be right. After all, 2020 in America uh, does seem to have some of those dimensions, even perhaps 2021. But what I think he leaves out of his picture is also the commitment of the American elite to a global imperial, its global imperial status, its its a heavy uh, investment of personnel and of elite positions in its sort of national security state apparatus and the conflicts between that apparatus and the people. Now let me go on to the theme of how this trope of social fragmentation plays out in the idea of the elites, the 1%, the elites versus the rest, the 1% versus 99%. Now, of course, one understanding of these cri- the, these sort of crises of so- social fragmentation is the people versus the elites. It's a common theme in history that social unrest builds and then there is a popular overthrow of the government. There is a revolution. That's what happened in France, that's what happened in America, that's what happened in Russia, that's what happened in China and many other countries. And in a way, it's also uh, played out in things like, you know, the colour revolutions, the velvet revolution, all the rest of it. And it's also sentimentalised, I guess you could say, in radical politics, the whole Occupy Wall Street movement described, espoused itself as the 90, we are the 99% and opposed to the dramatic inequality in society, the 1% who were Wall Street. And of course, this is also a recurring theme in history. Karl Marx, who, let me just say, I'm not advocating here, I'm just quoting here. Karl Marx uh, said in his uh, Communist Manifesto, The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Social conflict between two groups who are polarised. There he also said, or gave examples of that, as freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight that each time ended either in the revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending societies. Popular overthrow or social breakdown, one could say. So this theme of uh, social fragmentation clearly plays out in the popular discussion of elites versus masses and it it is a abiding interest in history. I myself never really bought the Marxist theory of history and and let me just add a little later footnote here that you can listen to episode 23 on the 8 hour working day or episode 52 on professions and guilds in games and history if you're interested in some of my own historical work on the history of work and how that affects the history of class back to the remastering of the show so that's just to say when we get into this realm of social fragmentation it's very easy to then build into it 
this ongoing narrative of the the Marxist slash progressive version of history where social conflict between groups, between the rich and the poor, let's say, or the working class and the ruling class or whatever, is fundamentally should be brought to a, uh, a peak in order to overthrow the institutions that represent the 1% and bring in genuine 99% type institutions. And I don't really see our current circumstances in that way. I think there's a different kind of social fragmentation going on. It's a fragmentation that's not just between rich and poor. It's also between high status and low status. It's between trust and distrust. It's between inner city elite and bogans. It has a cultural element. It has a whole way of life element it has an environmental element. The more sort of industrial union-based people who want to keep a you know carbon-based economy sort of thing. The Yellow Shirts movement was precipitated by a conflict over petrol tax. So this theme of 99 versus 1% is very common at the moment in popular discussion. But it is also developing in curious ways. Like there's a whole lot of conservative, broadly let's say conservative political thinkers in America who are increasingly explicitly saying, viewing America as run by a ruling class, uh, which they are not part of, or see America as degenerating into an oligarchy of big tech and you know, big farmer. And so this social fragmentation has many forms. It's not just a popular replay of rich versus poor. Social fragmentation drives conflicts, but it also drives forms of cooperation. So, uh, you know, one, one of the things about the Occupy Wall Street movement was it wasn't really the poorest who often who were protesting. It was often quite wealthy kids of privileged families and all the rest of it. So they're sort of reaching in a way outside of their social group to find connections with others and to try to mobilise together with them. So there are forms of cooperation that are occurring across those sort of groups. So I guess I can I think it's see from that how this trend of social fragmentation is sort of bubbling away in society and can then get attached to all sorts of issues. It can at some point be seen as a progressive thing of the, you know, the Occupy Wall Street concept, the people versus the ruling elite, but it can also have quite different political complexions um, as perhaps is there as well and can make for real difficulty when let's say ruling elites or competing elites uh, attempt to change the behavior change the attitudes of large groups within society and it's this theme i guess of not just the one percent versus the 99 percent but conflicts with in elites, that is also something that comes through in in Turchin and and Emmanuel Todd's arguments, and it's actually also quite a common theme in uh, histories of revolutions, etc. That these events of social breakdown often aren't so much about conflict between the one percent and the ninety nine percent, although there's certainly that. But there's also intense competition between fragmented and competing elites and less obvious networks of cooperation between elites and masses. In the French Revolution, there was a a huge fragmentation, I guess, of the elites and a demand from a much broader group of elites to occupy positions of status and power, not just the, you know, let's say the the Bourbons and their top aristocrats, but uh, the many lawyers who 
were such uh, an important part of the French Revolution, like Robespierre, Saint Saint and uh, etc. etc. And there was, you know, these these big reaching down, let's say, of certain elite groups into the masses as well, who would organise the masses and all, all the you know, Saint Cloutes, etc. The through the uh, radical clubs and the, the the revolutionary press and all the rest of it. So sometimes revolutions can be around competition within elites and claims of different power within elites that then gets overlaid with some of these broader inequalities in society. And sometimes those elites turn quite viciously, those revolutionary elites turn quite viciously on the ordinary people who don't subscribe to their views. Again, if you think about the French Revolution, there was a huge and incredibly tragic series of events uh, in the French Revolution called the Bondé, where there was enormous resistance from uh, largely, you know, peasant and ordinary people, let's say, in uh, a part of France called the Bondé, uh, who were sort of loyal to the church and to some degree to the monarchy and were resistant to the more sort of revolutionary ideas of the Jacobins and all the rest of it. And there was basically, well, uh, mass murder. Um, like people were put on boats and the boats were sunk. Uh, there was a, I guess, almost like a ethnic cleansing sort of uh, situation. Uh, incredibly awful, awful torture and massacres of, of people. Uh, I, I, I don't have the numbers to hand, but it's, you know, deeply tragic. The Vendée Rebellion was partly a rebellion against the progressive and secular French Revolution, including, you know, making marriage a non-religious event. Uh, there was great loyalty to the priests. There was great loyalty to the countryside and I guess a traditional way of life. And they effectively rebelled against the revolution. And then in the terror, the French revolutionary government had an organised, effectively organised extermination, let's call it, of the both the ordinary people and the priests and the leaders and the rebels and the, the social elites within the more conservative Vendée region. And let me just read from Simon Sharma here about some of the kind of things that were done. So one senior militant commander proposed systematic depopulation of the brigands deported and dispersed throughout France or sent to Madagascar. Another one proposed putting arsenic in well. Any town or hamlet known to have received rebel troops would be wiped out. Crops were burned, farm animals slaughtered, barns raised, etc., etc. They considered distributing casks of poisoned brandy to the region. There was even consideration of the possibility of using, quote, mines, gassings, or other means to be able to destroy, put to sleep, or asphyxiate the enemy. A truly shameful event to be honest, and just as a bit of an aside, of course, the in the historiography of the French Revolution, the Vendée uh, is quite famous because the generally leftist Marxist historians uh, who, of the French Revolution who really dominated things until, really until, I don't know, the 70s or 80s, and to some degree, Simon Sharma's book was, you know, a clarion call against. Uh, really refused to really acknowledge the Vendée uh, and the extraordinary inhumanity that happened there. Anyhow, I seem to have gone on a bit of a, a digressive rave about the Vendée and use as just an example of, of, I guess, how horrible social breakdown and revolution can actually be and how fights within different elites is not always a great thing. But look, it, it's also a feature of the Russian Revolution, this sense of competing elites who were uh, thought they could sort of outwit each other, so to speak, uh, in terms of control of the institutions, and ended up 
just creating chaos that was then uh, exploited by the Bolsheviks to take over society and destroy them all. So often the ruling class, who I think either Lenin or Marx once described as the committee, or, or described the state as the committee of the bourgeoisie, often that class is just bickering amongst itself. And even today we see these these uh, battles for status. Often big social crises are characterised not just by social cleavage between elites and the rest, the rich and the poor, the plebs and the patricians, but conflicts within elite groups for limited positions of power and status and the fissures between broad privileged social groups that arise because of that. It's not just that the elites lose the trust of the masses, but there is social fragmentation and competing ways of life, let's say, at multiple levels. And I think we see some of this sort of elites turning on themselves today at different levels, at a comic level. Let's say we see uh, Richard Branson and uh, Jeff Bezos competing for who can be the most ridiculous billionaire space passenger or the first billionaire space pas- passenger to launch themselves into space and, and thank uh, all the people they exploit in their company for the privilege of doing so. But we also see more vicious kinds of elites turning on themselves. Part of the the phenomenon of Polar, political polarisation that people talk about is this loss of the ability of elites, let's say, to work together to share status and power and to be within the same country, to agree to disagree. When elites want to deplatform other elites, when elites want to say, if you don't subscribe to our view of the world, get out, That's a real sign of social fragmentation turning into a destructive uh, form. Let me then just talk a little bit about this theme, uh, which I flagged earlier on, of elite overproduction, which Peter Turchin and to some degree also Emmanuel Todd in his discussion of the growth of mass higher education, which we discussed last week, put down as one of the causes of this growing social fragmentation and potential conflict between elites. Elite overproduction is essentially too many skilled people with big aspirations you know a rich society like ours still only has so you know it has a hierarchy and only so many people can climb to the tops of organizations only so many people can climb uh, become celebrities only so many people can can uh, occupy positions of high status only so many people can be members of status club but the, the spread of wealth, the spread of education is much greater than that. So as uh, another historian, Mark Mizuchi, says, there's a lot more highly educated people these days who face limited career prospects. And that feeds resentment. And this is what Turchin describes as elite overproduction. And it leads to, I guess, competition, you know, more fevered competition amongst uh, those elites for the the scarce positions of status and power. Turchin describes elites not just as like the capital owners, not just the billionaires, but also lawyers, media professionals, entertainment industry people. Five. He also uses the term dream hoarders, people who vie for fixed positions and translate wealth or education into political position or social status. And as there are more and more people who are who capable or aspire to those sort of roles, there's more intense and perhaps more bitter competition between people. He says the situation, this is Turchin, 
and I quote, the situation becomes so extreme they start undermining social norms and there is a breakdown of institution. Who gets ahead is no longer the most capable, but the one who is willing to play dirtier. Now, I think this is an interesting hypothesis. I don't think it really totally describes Australia very well. Certainly there is a mass growth in higher education, but I don't know if it has quite led to the same vicious competition for positions of status. I think in America there is something different that's going on because America has the added dimension of being a society with with growing polarisation, a society with greater competition amongst elites, but it's also a society that has this self-awareness of itself as the global empire of American exceptionalism. And that is not just dream, it's also a whole. It's all the positions in the security organisations, the CIA, etc. It's all the, um, it's the military roles, it's all the think tanks, it's all the the um in a way extraordinarily insular but it's hollywood it's the powerful journals and magazines it's the whole sort of dream imagination machine the dream merchants of uh, american culture and I think what's going on for them and why, partly why they've reacted so viciously to Donald Trump, regardless of the personal weaknesses of Donald Trump, is that he questioned uh, the predominance of that global empire status. He was literally an, out, you know, an outsider elite, a billionaire not accepted by other billionaires, who threaten this whole house of cards. So the way in which elite overproduction, the way in which social fragmentation manifests itself is very different. And I think what we're seeing in America is actually social fragmentation interacting with imperial decay. But it's also interesting to think about how it plays out in our own society in uh, Australia. So there are different cultural traditions and national traditions and patterns of cooperation, I guess, between cultures and different histories. In America, there is this imperial tradition. In Australia, there's more of this, this, I guess, egalitarian, fair go, quiet Australian type tradition. That means we have a different response to social fragmentation and perhaps a more healthy response, a a response where there is less at stake. And I think part of the great crisis for American society at the moment is that its social fragmentation is feeding into its imperial decay and its cultural decay, creating a greater crisis. So when I talk about these four big themes, I guess um, in my little history of our times, I'm very conscious that America is a bit of a theatrical extreme, but it's also, it, it is the imperial centre and um, it, it does, it what goes on in there has a big impact on our own lives. So finally, let me turn to the last little theme of this uh, episode, which is how our societies, at least um, the ones that aren't America, because I don't know how much hope they have there in America, can respond positively to this trend of social fragmentation, how it can build bridges between its fragments uh, and become not an island society, not a cohesive single whole, but a society of islands. What do we do about them? How do we live better in the present with the knowledge that we develop of the past and how the past is still resonating today? So effectively, I think what we need to do is strengthen cooperation between people of different identity rather than necessarily intensify the way in which people identify with their particular identities. 
rather than isolate people in those identities. I think as uh, Vaclav Havel said, and I think I might have said this in the episode about Vaclav Havel, identity is an invitation to dialogue, not a prison. Let's imagine two images, a walled city or a quarantined island. That might be one version of a society. A strong, cohesive society with strong borders and uh, a single people, a cohesive identity, safe from outsiders, safe from the virus, quarantined and walled off uh, from outside exchange. That's one, one image of how a society can be strong. But let's think of another image of a great city that is also uh, could be a different model for our society. And that's Stockholm. Stockholm is an archipelago of many islands. Stockholm City is situated on 14 islands. The broader Stockholm archipelago has 24 thousand islands and islets and it's a magnificent city it's a magnificent city we all don't have to be in one walled off single place single cohesive identity in order to live well let's be more like stockholm let's develop our world as a society of islands and not an island society. If we approach our society, if we approach social fragmentation not as a threat but just as a topographical characteristic of our society, I think we have more open conversations that inquire about experience and respond to the reality of social differences rather than uh, trying to fit social differences into some old stories of the 1% versus the 99% of social revolution, of popular revolt, of particular patterns of change. I think if we approach our society as, a, uh, if we approach social fragmentation as a society of islands, we have fewer sermons from elites about change, you know, change in my way. We have less less tough love from Macron towards the uh, gilets jaunes and more respectful, open dialogue between people uh, of different perspectives. Faced with more powerful forces of differentiation, social differentiation, and that is, I think, the reality of what we face with ageing, with family structures, with longevity, with wealth and what that generates for people in terms of so many choices about culture and living and all the rest of it with all those powerful forces of differentiation i don't think we want a more cohesive society a more ideologically conformist society we don't want everyone to subscribe to american exceptionalism we actually want a more civil society with more biodiversity, with more crazy fertility, a more great overgrown garden perhaps where we can live and let live rather than all live in the same way. And that's, I think, perhaps the big way in which we should think about social fragmentation. Not as a threat, but as a new reality, a new a new force of social differentiation uh, and one which we should respond to constructively, cooperatively and civilly. And in a way, how we respond to change is the big historical theme I want to take up next week. Change has become a bit of a change and reform has become something that that is you know the sermon from the mount from the elite directed to everyone everyone being told to be agile and all the rest of it it's something people i think that is is 
is generating conflict in the society. Conflict has grown in our societies as elites have urged change on the masses and on their competing elites. Be like us, believe what we have to say, make the world change in the way we want it to change. And even more broadly, I think over the sweep of history, change has accelerated. It's a, this is a common theme, you know. It's never, never has there been such rapid change in our societies. I think that that acceleration of change has perhaps been over enthusiastically celebrated by elites, a little too eager to nudge society along in their preferred direction, and that over enthusiastic celebration of change has, annoys people. Uh, it makes them think that. You know, really all they want to do is is force them to change their way of life. And I think it also rubs up against patterns of most of human history. After all, most of human history, life, culture, society has been relatively stable. And it's that theme of change and how, how the theme of social fragmentation is refracted through tension around change and continuity that I'm going to turn to the final episode of this little mini series that will address the last dimension of social fragmentation which is how that happens in change. So that is the end of the show. Um, I hope that's given you some new insight into social fragmentation and also helps you see increasing differences in society and not as a threat uh, and also see identities not uh, as a prison but as Barclav Havel said, an invitation to dialogue uh, I will be back next week. If you did find this discussion of social fragmentation interesting, you might want to check out my Substack, my free weekly newsletter at my Substack, jeffrich.substack.com. And you can also choose there to upgrade your subscription, in which case you'll get a regular additional essays from me and I'm writing a whole series on the poly crisis at the moment including a series of essays on the social crises of our time including this very topic of social fragmentation so check out my Substack uh, and consider a subscription and also if you haven't already done so why don't you check out your favourite online retail bookstore and buy 13 Ways of Looking at a Bureaucrat Writing on Governing, my recent book. There will be some things there that will surprise you. There will be some things there that might even shock you. And whatever uh, it is, you will certainly get a better insight into my life, my views on uh how to govern our society as well, and my writing. Uh, okay, everyone, thanks for listening. Do leave a positive rating and a review on your podcast platforms and share the Burning Archive in your social networks. I'm sure there'd be friends of yours who might find some of what I talk about interesting. So until next time... Uh, thanks for listening and do remember what thou lovest well will not be reft from thee. <laughs>